Hey everybody, I'm Asib, and today I'm going to be giving a talk on why crypto inevitably creates DeFi. So, um, to start off with, let me give you a little bit of background on who I am. So I'm Asib Qureshi, a managing partner of Dragonfly Capital, which is a global crypto venture fund. Uh, before I was at Dragonfly, I was a general partner at Metastable Capital, one of the oldest technology-focused crypto hedge funds. And there I was a seed investor in Avalanche. So I've known the Avalanche team for a very long time and have been an early supporter of the project. Uh, before I got into the investing side, I used to be a software engineer at Airbnb and then at Earn.com, which got acquired from Coinbase, and then later founded a stablecoin startup. So I've seen the crypto industry both from the side of you know, an engineer and a builder, uh, but also now as a side from an investor. It's part of what informs my perspective on DeFi and its role within the evolution of the cryptocurrency industry. So let me kind of tell a story, at least a story that I see of how DeFi plays into the evolution of cryptocurrencies and smart contracts. So everybody kind of knows the story, but I'll, I'll go through it because I think it's important to reiterate it. Um, before Bitcoin arrived, uh, the internet didn't really have a purely digital form of money. At that time, uh, in the early days of e-commerce, the only way to send money online was using legacy systems such as wire transfers, credit cards, ACH, uh, this led to a hodgepodge of different solutions, none of which were really that uh, internet native in the way that they were used. So the big breakthrough, of course, in all this was Satoshi Nakamoto publishing the Bitcoin white paper. And in it, he solved the fundamental problem that many companies before him had failed to solve, which was creating an internet native form of digital money. And so with Bitcoin, for the first time, the internet had its own form of money, something that didn't require any connection to the external world, to any company, to any individual. Uh, it was a decentralized protocol that lived entirely on the internet. And that was great for what Bitcoin was, but it turned out that it was actually quite bad at being money. And so what I mean by that, is, you know, fairly obvious things, right? Transactions take over 10 minutes to finalize. The coin itself was extremely volatile and merchants didn't really want to accept it as payment. It wasn't very scalable. Uh, it, it was quite slow. It's very difficult for them to communicate that experience to their users that, hey, you can send us Bitcoin, but you know, it might take up to an hour for us to actually decide that the Bitcoin has been received and, and fully finalized on the blockchain. Uh, but that being said, uh, you know, many people saw the promise within Bitcoin, uh, but you know, the, in, in uh, the period of time when Bitcoin started really gaining a lot of popularity, uh, the narrative that many folks in the traditional world saw from Bitcoin is that, hey, okay, this thing's cute. Uh, maybe you guys can use it to buy drugs or do other weird things online. Uh, but Bitcoin itself, internet native money, that's probably not the real innovation. The real innovation is the thing underneath it, blockchain. And so this narrative became known as Bitcoin, or sorry, it became known as blockchain, not Bitcoin. And the story here is that maybe the underlying technology is what really matters. Bitcoin itself is this weird artifact. It's what these you know, crazies on the internet are using. But what else can you do with a blockchain? And so there was this narrative that was very much promulgated, especially in 2016 and 2017, by consultants and by you know, folks like uh, Gartner and Deloitte, who essentially sold the story that there are hundreds of different applications that can be subsumed under uh, the, 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 the innovation of blockchain. So things like auditing and IoT and asset ownership and supply chain management, all these different things that were going to be almost magically solved in one fell swoop using the fundamental primitive of blockchains. And so it's really only now in retrospect that we can see that the vast majority of this blockchain hype turned out not to hold a lot of muster. Uh, there was this great uh, overview that was published by Cambridge, uh, which sort of benchmarked many of the enterprise applications that uh, were initially touted as uh, impl implementations of blockchain and turned out very, very few of them actually turned out to have had any kind of meaningful adoption. Most of them were just a, a news article, some tweets, a great blog post, uh, but then they sort of uh, got retired somewhere into the basement of corporate innovation projects. And so you know, what, what happened was that the world ended up pulling back from this blockchain story and started to take the crypto aspect of crypto, uh, of cryptocurrencies, more seriously. And so, you know, in retrospect, we, we sort of pulled back and saw that, okay, hey, Bitcoin was a breakthrough, fine. It's not a great payment system, but so the narrative 
kind of transfused and said, hey, but it's inforgeability, it's scarcity. It makes it a great store of value, right? It's a great digital gold is the narrative that, that Bitcoin eventually evolved into. Uh, but it was recognized that Bitcoin's functionality was minimal. There were a lot of things that one wanted to do if you had digital money, but Bitcoin couldn't really deliver on them. And so the, the natural question is, okay, once you make money digital, what else can you do? What else do you want to do with digital money? And so you had this renaissance of many other coins uh, that became known as these sort of uh, these altcoins. Right? These coins like Blackcoin, Litecoin, Namecoin, Feathercoin, uh, and, and these different uh, uh, peer coin, another example, uh, many of these coins basically took one extra feature or one extra part of Bitcoin's very limited uh, virtual machine and tried to make Bitcoin do more things than it originally did on the chain. Um, and all of them were, were kind of out of this recognition that, okay, once you have digital money, of course you have all these other things you want to do with digital money. But you know, there, was, there was this application uh, called Ethereum that basically said, look, uh, if, 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 you, if you just generalize this whole thing and you make all contracts digital, what if you make it so that property and money can be completely governed by code? So not just kind of dingy little you know, one-off opcodes that you can do and you know, check, this, check this signature, check that signature, but instead you allow any arbitrary code to govern the way that money is appropriated. And that created the advent of what we now call smart contracts through Ethereum and through Solidity, which was you know, kind of the first janky smart contract platform that we really had in cryptocurrencies, uh, this created a sea change in the way that people started to perceive what cryptocurrencies could do, how they could be fundamentally different than any form of money that preceded them. And so that led almost instantly after the creation uh, and the, the, the widespread adoption of Ethereum to the ICO bubble. And of course, ICOs, they led an aggregate to over $14 billion that was raised. I remember at the time, you know, people, were, people were just uh, absolutely going crazy over this idea that ICOs were going to displace venture capital. And that pretty soon, you know, VCs were going to be a thing of the past and every company was going to start raising money through ICOs. Of course, in retrospect, we see kind of how crazy this is. But at the time, there was this real energy around the idea that ICOs were fundamentally different, that this was almost a perfect use case that married smart contracts to you know, old school forms of capital formation. And so now how does this all relate to DeFi? I promise you this is gonna be a talk about DeFi. Here I am talking about ICOs and blockchain. Um, what's, what's, where, where am I taking you here? Uh, here's the claim I wanna make for you, is that DeFi is actually the generalization of every step that has been taken before getting to the point where we are today. Okay, let me, let me flip, paint out that, that picture for you. So, uh, you know, what is DeFi to start with? DeFi is a generalization of this new financial infrastructure that started with Bitcoin being digital gold, then to uh, uh, Ethereum being sort of digitally programmable money. Uh, now we have things like Compound, which is to get a loan from a smart contract. Uh, we have things like UMA, which allow you to create any real world synthetic asset uh, just with an Oracle and using cryptocurrencies on the blockchain. So you can create you know, uh, synthetic dollar, uh, synthetic bonds, synthetic uh, equities, all on the blockchain, all programmable and tradable. Uh, and then of course you have zero X, which is a protocol for uh, buying and selling, trading uh, any kind of digital, digital goods. So how did this story progress from start to finish? And here's the, the narrative I want to present to you. So it started with Bitcoin in 2009, right? That was the genesis of this whole industry. And we now, you know, looking back, we sort of see, okay, Bitcoin was the digital numeraire. It was the gold, right? And where, you know, if you sort of take the gold story, gold really began kind of being used as a medium of exchange in ancient Egypt. So that takes us all the way back to 3000 BC is what Bitcoin is trying to be, okay? And so then six years later, you get Ethereum. And Ethereum is sort of analogous to the creation of contract, arbitrary contract governing any sort of financial arrangement. And that really takes us back, really not that much farther in our ancient history, but really it takes us back to ancient Sumeria and the creation of you know, modern contract law. Um, and so then, almost very immediately after Ethereum, we get to ICOs. And what are ICOs in principle, but the Joint Stock Corporation? It's capital formation. It's raising money for ventures. Uh, and so this takes us to the 1500s and the East India Company. And then in, you know, in, the, in, the, uh, conceding, uh, in the success of two years after the ICO boom, 
that's when you really started to see this large scale blossoming of what we now call DeFi. And DeFi, it's sort of an umbrella term. Really what DeFi means is the, the generalization of all the other financial primitives that you want to fill out a robust decentralized financial system. So it's things like money markets, things like lending, things like synthetic assets, things like insurance, all sorts of, of, of trading and financial activity that you would see in a financial system, but all in a crypto native infrastructure. That is DeFi. And, and really, you know, if you think about it, decentralized finance, gold is part of finance, contracts are part of finance, uh, you know, fundraising is part of finance. And so I see really DeFi as a new, it's, you know, essentially a marketing term, but really it describes everything in crypto that has really worked up to this point. They've all fallen under the, under the, the header of this evolution of, of crypto decentralized finance. So DeFi, of course, is growing very rapidly. We've seen a meteoric growth uh, this year alone, but even over you know, the, last, uh, the last few years in the, the acceleration and penetration of DeFi. Uh, today, you know, some top line numbers, DeFi has over $10 billion in AUM, even these numbers are right now outdated, uh, 16 plus billion in loans originated and over $50 billion in trading volume. Uh, most of that happening, of course, this year. And uh, you know, DeFi more broadly, I'm often asked by people, so why do you think DeFi is going to work? Isn't it just sort of over leveraged, crazy? You know, just sort of, isn't it just more speculation that's happening in, in DeFi? And of course, almost everything in crypto, when you, when you saw it happening at the time, was driven by speculation. Of course, the same thing was true of the internet in the dot-com bubble. Uh, but there's something I think fundamentally different about DeFi, which I think makes it so powerful and so obviously the direction of innovation. And it, there's, a, there's a quote by Adam Thierer that I really like that describes this in a term called permissionless innovation. He describes it this way. He says, will innovators be forced to seek the blessing of public officials before they develop and deploy new devices and services? Or will they be generally left free to experiment with new technologies and business models? This is the idea behind permissionless innovation. And you know, take AWS, for example. The internet was disruptive because it allowed anybody to build an application for just $20. And that app could reach a global audience through cloud computing and the ability for anybody to rent a server or rent cloud time anywhere in the world and build their app and test it and let their ideas flourish in this global marketplace. That is what changed everything in the innovation of the internet. Many people forget that in the early days of what was perceived as the internet, the story was not that it was going to be this decentralized architecture that anybody was going to be able to build a business and distribute to anyone in the world. The original vision for the internet by many of the large companies at the time was called the information superhighway, which was largely promulgated by Microsoft. The perception was that the internet was really going to be owned by large companies at the time. It was, it was going to be that you were going to access the internet probably through your TV. You were going to have a smart TV that was going to mediate all of this because people thought, of course, the brands that exist today are going to mediate everything. Turned out, the internet evolved in a completely different direction. And the innovators in the internet were also completely different from the old guard that regulated media in the United States and in, in sort of the broader uh, economies of, of Europe and Asia. Uh, it turned out the internet evolved in a completely different direction because of the fact that the internet was permissionless. Anybody was allowed to build their own application and take it to a global marketplace and compete. The same thing is going to happen in finance via DeFi. You are not going to have to ask for permission of some public regulator or of the incumbents who already exist and own these markets. No, instead, through crypto, entrepreneurs from anywhere in the world will have the right to innovate, to, to try out their own ideas in the marketplace, to, and to do that with almost no fixed costs. Blockchain therein is going to do to finance what the internet did to almost every other industry. You know, it, it, it's striking to me when you look at how much the internet has done to almost every industry, almost every industry is unrecognizable compared to what it was 30 years ago. But the one exception to that, of course, is finance. In a lot of ways, you know, if you think about what the, you know, the banking experience is like, uh, really the, kind of the primary difference with banking is that now, instead of going into a branch or you know, calling up my, my banker, instead I can check my bank on my mobile phone. But really, almost everything else is basically the same. And I think uh, a blockchain is going to accelerate the, the intersection of technology and finance. And so what DeFi allows for 
is it allows for permissionless financialization of assets that were previously excluded from the financial system. So think of NFTs, non-fungible tokens, such as uh, crypto gaming uh, aspects, wearables, uh, art, uh, think of gaming, uh, think of data marketplaces. Uh, you know, there, there's been so much change in the way that we think about what kind of assets are valuable and what kind of assets are, are going to be traded and financialized. Uh, but, but finance itself has not really kept up with the, the rate of change in technology. Uh, and so it's gonna, it's gonna be up to blockchains and public crypto uh, and DeFi platforms to make up for that difference and create the global marketplaces that we need for all of these new digital assets that are, that are coming. And so there's already been a Cambrian explosion in the startups, in the, in the uh, users, in the, uh, in, the, in the number of entrepreneurs who are coming into the space. And I don't think it's going to stop anytime soon. So DeFi, needs a new operating system. It started on Ethereum, but Ethereum, it's very clear, cannot handle the scalability requirements. Uh, so as we move from MS-DOS to the operating systems of the modern day, I, I believe that Ethereum, certainly Ethereum 1.0, is not going to be sustainable as the operating system for DeFi. It's going to need new contenders to come up and take the mantle of what DeFi demands of them. And that's part of the reason why I'm so excited about Avalanche. So, Crypto is about permissionless finance. It has always been about permissionless finance. And Ava, I believe, is moving DeFi forward by giving it a new operating system to build upon. So from starting from the very beginning with Bitcoin to Ethereum to ICOs and today to DeFi, I think the trend that we've been seeing is clear. And that is why I'm excited for Ava to step up and take the mantle of being a next generation blockchain to serve the needs of DeFi.